Hey, and welcome back to the Math Minds Project Tuesday evenings here. This is Ken Globerman back with uh, the Math Minds community. Happy to have everyone back, the Math Minds team, as well as so many regulars who've been joining us from Brooklyn College, from uh, Baruch College, and frankly, uh, from across CUNY for that matter. But most of, our, most of our community are from those two particular CUNY schools. Uh, this week, we're happy to have three guests joining us in a panel-like discussion. Uh, today's discussion is titled, Math Really Matters. And our three guests will be talking about how math, data visualization, analysis more generally, and let's call it numerical literacy, comes up in their day-to-day -day jobs. They come from different sectors, doing different things. They'll bring different perspectives. And we'll let them introduce themselves. Um, so I, I, rather than me kind of diving into the details, um, before we get started, just a couple of things. There's no presentation today. I mean, I, I, we don't have a PowerPoint for you. Um, so uh, we, won't, we won't be showing you, I won't be showing you a presentation, though our guests may show you some slides. Um, so, but what I wanted to say was for today, if you have a question, uh, use the digital hand raise and we'll pepper in. So what I'll be doing is moderating the panel discussion with our three guests. And what I want to do is pepper in questions from you guys. So rather than interrupting, like we might do in a normal Tuesday meeting, use the hand raise and then we'll call on you to unmute and ask your question. And I will tell you that, as you know, we've been keeping tally on attendance as well as scoring points for people who have been answering math mission challenges correctly. Well, you'll be scoring points today again by asking our panel thoughtful questions. So Michelle will be actually accounting for who asked questions. Uh, so you know, another incentive for you. And let me remind you, we will acknowledge after today, when we tally everything up, we will acknowledge the person from the Math Minds community who got the most points from challenges met, as well as the person who had the greatest attendance across the entire spring. So if you think you're in the running, this is your last chance, all right? So with that in mind, let me just do a one or two sentence introduction of our three panel members today who are on the Zoom call already, which is great. Um, by alphabetical order, last name, we'll start with Brian Falkenstrom. And Brian is actually a former student of mine. He graduated from Brooklyn College in 2019. Uh, and in his last year was the president of the Student Leadership Council. He also, by the way, was uh, an active participant in the Toastmasters program. He's currently a loan consultant at Better Mortgage and has previous experience in retail sales and analytics with Land's End. Brian will begin Baruch's MBA program this coming fall and hopes to further develop his career in business analytics and strategy. That's Brian. Now I'm just gonna go through the three folks and then I'll, we'll turn it to them to tell you more about themselves. We then have Sandy Lohani and Sandy is from India where he completed his MBA with a major in finance from Mumbai University uh, and his undergrad degree in electronics. Sandy has 18 years of business work experience and currently working as CFO for a microfinance institution. Welcome, Sandy. And finally, we have Nassim Syed. And Nassim graduated from Brooklyn College in 2018. He's a senior tax analyst at Culligan International, focused on corporate income tax and developing digital automations. Previously, he worked for PwC in investment management tax, primarily doing tax work for hedge and private equity funds. Nassim was never more, this is him saying it by the way, not me, was never more than an average math student and at work relies on mathematical ratios, formulas and concepts each and every day. So welcome Brian, Sandy and Nassim. Let's give them all a digital round of applause. 
So when I call on y'all, uh, Brian, Sandy, and the Sim, I guess the best way to do this is just unmute when you're asking a question, when you're answering a question. I will go around and, and uh, ask different questions to each of you, but if one of you want to jump in and add to something, of course, that someone else is asked, answering, of course, feel free to, uh, to go ahead and do so. So let's kind of go backwards now. We'll start with Nassim. So I gave the two, two sentence introduction of you. In a couple of, just in a couple of minutes, Nassim, tell us a little bit more about you. Give us a little bit of the story in your own words. We already know your educational background. Just, you know, kind of tell us about you and your words just to break the ice here, okay? Nassim, can you do that? Can you start us off? Uh, sure, I guess. So yeah, I graduated in 2018. Uh, I was an active student uh, in the student body. I was the student body president uh, back in the day. Uh, so I did a lot of during, you know, my tenure during, in Brooklyn College. So I remember enjoying a lot of the extracurriculars. Um, and then I've been doing, I graduated with a degree in public accounting and finance. So I've been doing, I went the public accounting route, did that for two and a half years, moved into private accounting, industry accounting. Uh, now, uh, pretty much just working on my CPA exam and trying to learn more about automation and a little data analysis in my free time. Um, so that, that's me, you know, in terms of professionally and personally, you know, I love to cook, I'm, you know, and I love that more than anything. And, you know, I'm very happy to be able to do that now. And where are you, you live? Are you living in Chicago now? Is that accurate? I do. I do live in Chicago. I moved in the middle of the pandemic in July. Okay. So you started, you changed jobs during the pandemic and you're from Brooklyn originally? I am from Brooklyn originally. Okay, super. Thank you, Sandy. So guys, um, you don't have to repeat the educational stuff. This is more the personal touch, you know. So, you know, we, we already know where you all went to school and what you're doing now. So Sandy, just, know. you know, tell us a little bit about you and uh, add to your story just in one or two minutes. Yeah, thanks, Ken, for inviting me. This is an interesting initiative. And uh, Ken did share with me about this uh, uh, group uh, about a few months ago. And good to kind of uh, meet all of you here. So I am from uh, Mumbai, and uh, I'm, live, I'm living in Jersey City. Uh, and uh, uh, so as uh, Ken mentioned, I work uh, currently as CEO for, for uh, a microfinancial institution. We have operations across seven countries. Uh, so I, after my uh, after graduating in finance, uh, in MBA in finance, I kind of uh, started my career with uh, into management consulting. Then spent a couple of years with a, a private equity fund, uh, followed by uh, uh, some few years in an insurance company. And then I was uh, uh, for this company where I work for right now was uh, a country manager for uh, uh, their operations in uh, South Pacific, Fiji, and Solomon Islands. And uh, I moved to US in this role uh, three years ago so as CFO. So yeah, so it's like a interesting journey. I've gone through different kinds of uh, functions and uh, various roles across last almost 18 years. So that's what is me. And yeah, so good to see Nisim also as a cook. I also like cooking. <laughs> yep. And uh, yep. in fact, all the weekends, I actually spend a few hours cooking for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, Sandy, if he didn't say it now, Sandy is a really good cook. We had a barbecue, a picnic last year, and Sandy brought some really, really good Indian food. It was great. We're actually having another barbecue in a couple of weeks. I hope, Sandy, that you bring yes, more of that of great course. Indian food. Uh, <laughs> Sandy, for the, so the way I'm connected to Sandy, by the way, is Sandy is a part of my meetup group called New York, Get Active with New York Internationals. And I have over 2,000 people in a, in a meetup group um, uh, and mostly from abroad living in New York. Not always, for, not everybody from abroad, but mostly from abroad. So thank you, Sandy, for participating and, and giving uh, uh, your perspective on, on today's topic. Thank you. And Brian, actually, you know what, Brian, if you, what you could actually, if you noticed there was a question in the chat and it came up um, during the seams uh, answer, which is what's president of the Student Leadership Council? What do they do? So Brian, maybe you can answer that question and tell us a little bit about more about you as well. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Uh, so as far as the Student Leadership Council, uh, that is, uh, they essentially govern the business, the Koppelman School of Business specifically. 
Uh, they host a lot of the business related events like uh, Business Matters or the Sophomore Summit or uh, those type of events where they try to bring in business professionals to speak on campus or uh, I guess nowadays on Zoom. Um, so uh, you could always look them up. I believe they have a website and they're always recruiting new people to kind of help develop business skills and help you, you know, get ready for the workforce. Um, so they're a fun group. I really like them. Michelle's a former member as well. Um, as far as the rest of my bio goes, I know you summed up a lot in the uh, general intros there, but let's see, since graduating, uh, I've gotten married. Uh, all right, I met my right. wife in the library cafe, for those of you who remember <laughs> what campus used to be. Um, other than that, yeah, I've spent uh, about half a year in Wisconsin working for Land's End. I got a bit of a taste of the Midwest out there. Uh, fun group of people, but then I came back to New York and uh, I've been working as a loan consultant ever since. Uh, so that's pretty much it. And Brian, did you took two, two of my classes or one? I know you were in my organizational behavior class. Didn't you take entrepreneurship with me as well? I did not take your entrepreneurship, but it okay. feels like we spent more time together. <laughs> it does. Oh, maybe it's, 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 yeah. Well, actually, no, my, it was my first semester of book in college was your last semester of book in college, mm -hmm. actually, now that I think yeah. about it. So that was your graduating uh, spring. All right, great. Well, thanks again, guys. So um, let's go back to Nassim. Uh, Nassim, tell us how math or numbers play a critical role um, at your at your job. Give us maybe you can share, you know, some specifics. Just take it from there, Nassim. I mean, I mean, I'm a tax accountant, so by nature, everything is numbers based. Um, so basically, I work for a company that operates pretty much. Like every continent, like so many different countries. Um, and we're, we deal with like a lot of data. So a lot of sales data, a lot of expenses data. We're always, we have to do a lot of calculations on taxable. Like, I don't know, I actually don't know the pop, the general population of this course, if you guys are like finance or business heavy students. So across, I don't want to drop. The, all business, but across the board in terms of major. Okay, so yeah, I'll try not to drop too many accounting specific lingo, but we definitely like calculate a lot of, we have a lot of calculations based off of all of the entities trying to figure out what they've actually have in you know, with the actual earnings that they generated and then making sure that we pay taxes on that. So a lot of it is numbers based and then getting to that answer of what is your taxable income is like not even a simple question. There's so many different calculations. Uh, there's always constantly new laws and regulations. So as while we have tons of data and tons of numbers, we also have to look at it in a certain way and making sure that we're interpreting it correctly. Well, let me just kind of follow up with that for a second. So obviously you're in accounting, obviously there are numbers, as you said, but what if someone pushed back and said, hey, Nassim, but you know, isn't that what calculators are for? I mean, and don't, don't, we, don't we have software apps like TurboTax or, you know, uh, QuickBooks or Excel? Like, what do I need to know math for? Well, one, there's no like one software that's going to do everything for you, number off the bat. But and then this is not like a small tax return. It's simple. You know, it's, it, this is like a th thousands of pages of tax return uh, data that ultimately makes it. So it's not so super simple. We interact with about you know, we have like these foreign subsidiaries, each person is from a different country, speaks a different language, operates in a different system, has their own software that they're gonna utilize and we're bridging everything and putting it together. So there's no one adage and we do spend a lot of time using math and different like mathematical concepts, even simple as adding, right? Like theoretically, we're just adding all of this data but compiling that takes a big chunk of time. Fair enough. Okay, so let's go to Brian. And when we think about your time specifically in retail, which would juxtapose against, you know, uh, some of the, uh, the the more finance oriented work you do now, talk about how in Land's End, how uh, math or numbers would come up in Land's End in your role there. Yeah, yeah, of course. So uh, I think I had a unique perspective at Land's End too, because I started there in just like a regular sales role in their stores, which. That type of math is more so dealing with like customers on a day-to-day -day basis, figuring out discounts, percentages pay, play a huge role into that. And you get really good at, you know, telling a customer what 30% off actually means versus what they think it means. On the uh, headquarters side of it, it was more of like an analytics position for what uh, customers were calling in about and what information they're trying to get from us. Mm. So that's more of kind of parsing out uh, 
how many people are contacting us for certain dispositions and what can we do to lower the amount of people trying to call in? Like, what can we do to restructure information or, you know, how do we present the product to these customers in a way that's going to get them to reach out to us less? Fair enough. I think, and thank you. I think there's a question. Lee Fenson, you have your hand up. Did you want to ask something? Yes, um, it was a question specifically towards Brian. Hello, Brian. My name is Lee Funson. I'm a junior at Baruch, majoring in economics. And my question to you is, I also have some experience in the retail industry, but I also aspire to be a consultant. Um, I'm not sure what section or specific area of consulting I want to be. Um, I have my top three choices are strategic management, and I think human resources or financial, I'm just not sure, still depicting on the options. And I just wanted to ask, um, what are any advice or what is consulting to you? Is it like a job where you have great experience on and then, you know, you can give people advice or how do you, what is your definition of being a consultant, which I aspire to be? Consulting you'll find is not that different from operating at a store level as like a retail associate. So. On that level, you're dealing with small transactions of, uh, you know, oh, a customer wants this item for $10 or whatever they're shopping for. Because really, any role you take later than that is learning how to help people with whatever they're trying to achieve. So working in a store gives you that kind of micro experience of how to deal with people. What do they respond well to? What don't they respond well to? And really listening and trying to figure out what their needs are. Anytime you're kind of expanding that role and going into either a large and consulting role or any other type of business where you're essentially all you're doing is trying to help people. So if you can work that into your job, which, you know, from that type of experience, helping people is the nature of it. And that really, I mean, it gives you a leg up on anybody who hasn't had that type of intimate experience with customers. If that answers the question. Yes, it does. And another question that I have is um, I see myself really, you know, as I am still an undergraduate student, I don't really, I try to focus on like gaining jobs and internship experience with that will make me become a consultant, but I tend to get off track or confused of what I really want to do to reach that goal. Um, is there any like advice or any, um, you know, industry or types of internships I, I should focus on if I want to be like a financial consultant? It depends exactly what you're trying to do with that. Like, for example, like with a mortgage loan consultant, uh, usually companies like that, like I got my foot in the door with a customer experience role because that you still get your intro into the mortgage industry, but then you can kind of develop that into the consulting role because uh, essentially you're using your skills from retail to get the job, which it's not your target job, but at least gets your foot in the door to where you want to be within that company. So I'm not sure if every financial consulting type of role your company is going to have that type of in with customer experience, but uh, it's kind of a way that you can pivot is start with a job that you're not in love with, but as long as it's getting you to a place where you want to be, uh, you can kind and of- let, the, let me uh, just add to this actually, LeFence, and you know, when, when I was an undergrad student, I had no idea what a consultant was. Um, I heard the word, you know, actually, I think at that time, I may have not even been aware of the term consultant. It's very possible. I think when I was a grad student, we talked about going into consulting. And even as a, even in my MBA program, I didn't really know what it meant to be a consultant. And it, 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 it wasn't really until I started working after grad school with a consulting firm where I was the client um, that I started to get a better sense of what it is. And I'll just say to you, I would, you mentioned like three different areas of, of, in consulting. They are very different areas. All those areas you mentioned are very different areas. So be careful with the word consultant because people, you know, if, if you work on the floor of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of, of a retail store, they sometimes refer to those people as consultants. Also, you know, you can work at Home Depot, um, you know, uh, in the electronics department and they may call you a consultant. So you've got to focus, focus on the skills. Don't worry so much about the titles. Focus on the specific kind of area that you're interested in and then focus on getting skills uh, that help you get into that area. 
when it comes to management consulting or financial consulting more generally, the first job in is typically guess what called analyst. You don't start as a consultant typically, not in, not in the sense that I think you're thinking, Lee Fenson. Usually you start as an analyst and guess what? To be an analyst, you have to have strong analytical skills. And the, the back, the, what is the foundation of that? Strong numerical literacy skills, strong data visualization, the ability to present numbers to an audience, the ability, the ability to see trends in information and be able to actually draw conclusions from it. Those are some of the skills. And that's what we've been doing here with the Math Minds Project. So focus on skills, not on titles at this point in your life, okay? Um, all right, let's get- Thank you for the answer. Appreciate yes, it. sure. No, no problem. Um, uh, let's drill down. So um, Nassim mentioned adding, right? He said, you know, really what we're doing here in accounting is we're adding a bunch of numbers together, right? So I want to talk about math content areas. Uh, let's go back to Nassim for this, and we'll come to you, Sandy, right after this. Um, because I want to drill down this idea of math content, because a lot of times in school, we focus on, we focus in math by, you know, what do we talk about? Algebra, geometry, trigonometry, pre-calculus, calculus, right? And we get to college, typically, you know, the, 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 the conversation is usually pre-calculus or calculus, or what should we make up the prerequisite for this major? Should it be pre-calculus? Should it be something else? I'd like to hear from you, you guys, the panel, on from your day-to-day -day work life, the math content areas that really matter. I mean, like the actual math that's important, you know, and you, you know, don't feel shy to say that it's something simpler than we think it may be. So Nassim, tell us about the kind of actual math topic, like theoretical topics at the core that you run into in your day-to-day -day job. I think there's like a, a funny misconception that accountants are incredible at math and I can just rattle off calculations in my head. But the truth is, if you can add, subtract, multiply, divide, you can probably be an accountant. Uh, so sometimes it's as, simple, it's as simple as that. So a lot of the calculations is just based on those simple, you know, concepts. And then we do a lot of algebra. So algebra is very relevant in the real world because a lot of times you know, we know two parts of the problem, but we don't know the third and we're, and we're trying to figure that out. And that's algebra at its simplest. And it's that I, that bringing that idea, that concept, that that's what algebra is into your day-to-day -day work. That's when it starts to click like, oh, this is relevant from when I learned it in fifth grade, I'm currently using it. So we use like a lot of algebra, a lot of, like I said, like the four basic calculations, I would say a fair amount of ratios. Ratios are very common, fractions. I mean, you'll be, you'll be doing calculating percentages, comparing percentages. So it's not, it's not conceptual. It's not, it's not crazy polynomials. You're not doing anything at, in a calculus course, but the foundational skills, you're doing them on a day-to-day -day basis every day. So you would agree that being really, because, you know, we take for granted things like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, fractions, percents, right? But in fact, some people are more proficient at those simple things than other people. So you would agree that to be pr very proficient at working with percents and fractions and arithmetic, that that would all be valuable. A hundred percent. It's, it's right. very valuable to what we do every day. And someone who and, had a harder time seeing percents and fractions might struggle a bit if they had a hard time seeing percents and fractions. Yeah, you, you, you'll struggle. I mean, and, and it's it's not per, per, because it's difficult, but it's because it's used all the time. So, for example, you know, we're converting different currencies. Let's say you're working in operations with... Um, like you're converting pesos to dollars. Like that's a simple math. You just need to multiply it by the spot rate, but you have to know how to multiply these numbers. You have, and then sometimes I, I've caught myself making mistakes where I'm like, okay, well, I know the dollar is worth more. So, and I, instead of multiplying it by the rate, I divided, divided. it thinking you went the other way. And so sometimes I'm just looking at my calculation being like, this doesn't make sense. And it's because I know math in general right. and I question my calculations. Great example. You can't rely, right? So it you helps just... you, it helps all, you audit yourself. It helps you audit your mistakes. It helps you audit 
things that you may do wrong and accounting, obviously error, you can't have errors in, in your work. So, you know, being stronger mathematically with those basic calculations and operations helps you audit those problems. All, all the time. We're, we always like catch small, these like small mistakes. We're like, well, we're off by 6 million. That can't be something went wrong. And it's only because we're actually taking a step back and thinking about right. the process. So let me go to Sandy. And can you piggyback on the same question, Sandy? Talk a little bit about the math that you run into uh, as well as your colleagues at work and in the as a CFO, kind of what math is relevant and what math is like less relevant? Yeah, so as uh, Nissim mentioned, there are a few con uh, contents in maths, which uh, like, like if you look at uh, all through our education from schooling to college studies to our MBA studies, we do focus on a lot of things. There are a few kind of uh, contents which really uh, help you and and they are really important for you in your day-to-day -day job, right? So I call them commercial maths. Like if you pick up specific topics like uh, uh, averages, percentages, ratios, proportions, interests, right? These are things which are uh, like you are using thousands and times a day, like in every discussion. Right? Now, uh, one thing you mentioned that, okay, there are calculators, why do you need to kind of be so sharp in maths, right? Now the answer to it is, uh, typically if you are sitting on some in some meetings with a lot of senior guys, right? And uh, you are discussing uh, certain business plans or you're discussing the budgets or plans, it's all about numbers, right? When you're discussing it, you can't just keep pull pulling out the calculator every time. Like there are discussions on numbers where you have to on the fly, think about it and then uh, kind of uh, engage in the discussion. You don't have time to kind of go back and start uh, using the calculator, right? And I feel that uh, uh, having a, a very sharp kind of uh, uh, understanding of uh, numbers, quants, is very, very important uh, when it comes to uh, any role which is into uh, uh, finance or business planning or even uh, anything to do with uh, kind of uh, finances, right? Now, uh, not just finances. Now, when I come back to uh, different functions, like someone who is into, say, uh, business planning, right? Someone who is into, say, uh, uh, marketing, who is planning for certain products for um, a certain market, right? And for them also, they are just dealing with numbers. It's all about everything has to boil down to numbers when it comes to uh, working out the plans, right? So I think uh, uh, when it comes to uh, commercial maths, it's kind of everywhere. It, it comes into play in every... Uh, kind of uh, uh, part of your role. Now, there are some uh, kind of uh, uh, contents like which we have studied in terms of uh, uh, when you to look at things like quadratic equations, right? like complex algebras, calculus, all these things, differentials. These things, uh, uh, are, we all of us have struggled in our school time, college time. At least I struggled with it. It was kind of uh, not as easy as kind of uh, commercial maths. But you had to kind of pass through it. You have to kind of uh, somehow manage to kind of uh, uh, cross that line. We did that. But when it comes to real practical use of those things, at least when it comes to uh, uh, my job, I have not kind of uh, used those things uh, at all. But I do know a couple of my friends who are into uh, proper kind of uh, uh, equity research or innocent banking who uh, do use a lot of uh, certain this, this complex maths for their research activities, right? So certain jobs do require you to kind of have a much uh, uh, evolved kind of understanding of maths and where you start, you even use that, uh, not in all the roles. Some roles, if you look at people who are into uh, human resource management or training and development, front office management, right? So they can even manage their job with uh, maybe a little lesser kind of uh, uh, expertise in uh, quants and maths. However, in general, what I have felt is, and, in, and something which I have realized in all my jobs across different functions, having a sharp quantitative and analytical skills always helps you across any, any kind of uh, job, any role. Mm -hmm. You kind of uh, are able to kind of uh, create a, a good image of yourself that you carry a sharp brain. You are able to, people take you kind of, uh, start taking you seriously, start uh, kind of uh, reaching out to you for some uh, really serious job. They know that this person is good in numbers and he's accurate, right? So that kind of uh, eventually builds up 
And as we do, you grow in your career, it really kind of helps you all through. So for me, when I see my last 18 years of job, the most important thing which I feel, which has helped me across all the jobs, is my uh, mathematical skills. And I think like throughout my schooling and college, I never kind of uh, felt that it's so important. But when I got into my job, then I felt that that's the most important thing, which kind of helps you all through. Right. So, so that, that's my kind of uh, two bits on uh, uh, different kind of aspects of maths. And thank you. And, and, and I'll just say one thing, one book that I read a um, couple of years, a few years ago, which I would recommend to you guys, all of you on the call, there's a book called The Trusted Advisor, which I thought was very, very, very valuable for me, especially Lee Fenson, you said you wanted to go into consulting. Uh, anyone who thinks about a career in advising or consulting should check out The Trusted Advisor. And what's interesting about that book is it kind of helps you understand why when you're earlier on in your career, why having specific skills is so important and why people give you the kind of jobs and tasks that they do, because you haven't yet built that trusted, that, that level of trust for people to put you in a more, uh, in, in, in a more soft managerial type of work environment, right? It's much easier to, to, to have someone who's junior in a hard skill area because it's very compartmentalized and math analysis, right? These are hard skills. So it's a great way to get your career started by really having those, those strong analytical skills early on. All right, um, this is a question to all three, any of you. I'm just curious, have any of you um, ever had to take any type of math proficiency test of any sort during the recruiting process, whether it be for PwC, NISIM, or uh, Brian and your new job now as a loan consultant or anywhere along the way, Sandy, did anybody like, in the interview process ever give you like a test, a math test of sorts, anybody? Ms. Sim, you're saying no? Okay. For, for me, like uh, uh, in India, getting into a good B school requires you to go through a, <laughs> some really kind of a tough entrance exams, right? So for me, that was the uh, one tough exam I had to clear to get into one of the leading B schools in India. And I okay. somehow managed to kind of uh, uh, get All India 10th rank in that uh, exam. But that particular uh, test is really tough and I kind of, uh, I did kind of uh, make efforts to clear that. After yeah. that, uh, I, I never kind of uh, confronted any kind of uh, uh, proficiency test uh, okay. in my initial jobs. Okay. Maybe it's more because uh, uh, once you have that uh, uh, tag on your profile that you have passed a certain B school, kind of a lot of companies don't uh, they right. assume that you have fit out certain levels. They don't kind of attest you on that. Sandy, were you talking about the GMAT exam, the exam you talked about getting into business school or uh, something? In India, in India, it's CAT. It's called Common Admission Test. Oh. CAT. Oh, it's a different. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, for, for, for just so you all know, I mean, I, I think that some some of the bigger companies give problem solving or math literacy tests. Maybe just this panel hasn't run into that, but I know from. Uh, my work as a personal coach and other things I've done that, for example, uh, if you uh, try uh, Procter & Gamble, companies like Procter & Gamble and also Bain, the consulting firm Bain, as well as McKinsey, um, and I believe Boston Consulting, like just, just to name a few companies, um, uh, give math proficiency tests to make sure that you have the sort of problem solving skills uh, that they're looking for. But okay, I was just curious. So, Sandy, coming back to you, and uh, and do you ha are you in the position uh, where you've had to interview uh, junior people at, in your jobs? Have you done any interviewing of junior candidates in the past? Yes, I kind of uh, I have hired a lot of people in all my roles, and I continue to do that across levels: senior levels, mid levels, junior levels. So, so that's kind of. Uh, yeah. So in, in the job interview process, um, what would you rank on a scale of one to 10, the importance of a candidate's analytical skills? One to 10. It really depends on the function for which I'm hiring. So let's assume if I'm hiring someone as a business analyst or a finance analyst for my finance team, 
I will give a lot of focus to uh, 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 mathematical skills. Uh, maybe I will say on a scale of uh, 10, I will give a weight of almost seven to eight on that. That's okay. the most critical part for me. If I'm hiring someone for uh, HR or admin function or someone for my training team, there I might kind of uh, give a weight of maybe uh, uh, three to four on uh, quant skills. But it, it really depends kind of a lot on which function I'm hiring for. Certain skills, certain jobs require uh, uh, much sharper uh, acumen in terms of uh, quants and uh, analytics. Some jobs require less of that, so mm. that depends on it. Mm. Okay, thank you. And by the way, folks, let me just remind you, if you have a question, uh, think along the way, raise your digital hand anytime. You can do it even now, we'll get to you. Just raise your digital hand if you wanna ask a question to um, Nassim, Sandy, or Brian, okay? And while you're thinking about your next questions, let me go to Brian for a second here. So Brian, I remember uh, when I first met him, I think you were president that year of the um, Toastmasters, right? Weren't you president? I was never president of Toastmasters, no. I oh. think Michelle held it at that time. No, no, the, the year before Michelle, it wasn't you, no? No. Okay, Okay, but you were involved with Toastmasters, right? I was, I was in their meetings, yeah, I was involved. So I just saw you there. Um, yeah, fair right. enough, fair enough. Um, so I always say that data visualization is like telling your story with numbers. I always, I always use that line. So can you think whether it be in your current job or in your past uh, role at Land's End, can you think of any like presentations you were in or any situation, maybe even with a client, could have been a one-on-one -on -one presentation, could have been a group presentation where you had to like tell a story with, with a graph or with numbers. And can you kind of talk about an example of that? Yeah, so I'll circle back to Land's End in the analytics position for this one because uh, the main part of my role there was building a new knowledge management database to basically, uh, for any of the inbound inquiries we got, you know, how can we more efficiently deal with it, get people answers quicker, and thusly, you know, cut down on time people are spending trying to find the right answers. So, and with that, there's a lot of specific math of, you know, how many people are contacting us, for what reasons are they contacting us, uh, with certain solutions, uh, what percent, uh, you know, how much quicker can we actually get them answers, and what does this save the company in money? So it, there's a lot of math going on there. So data visualization, it's not even like, it's not just like a single graph. It's like summing up your whole project in, you know, you, know, you can't just like throw numbers in a presentation and have it make sense to an audience. You need to have a more clear way to describe, this is what the problem was, this is what this solution provides, and this is how it's gonna benefit the company. So, so data have you have you have you noticed in that role how putting the numbers on a page one way versus another way could make your story more or less compelling whether you put the numbers on the page with a certain type of graph or maybe using a pie chart instead of a scatter plot or not using any graphs at all have you noticed like different methods having better impact yeah i mean cuz uh, for example you know part of that solution, it wound up with like a 11% decrease in search time uh, for, you know, that part of the company. But 11% in, in and by itself, it doesn't sound like an impressive number. But when you scale it to, you know, how many people is that helping? How much time is this saving? That can add up to a giant number, you know, depending on the volume that you're working with. So it's definitely on a visualization scale. You know, presenting it differently is going to show, yeah. You know. And that's a great example because uh, percentages, and you said it, right, is percentages are only interesting when they're relative to something. Otherwise you have no frame, frame of reference, right? So there's a great example of knowing math well enough to know whether it's 1%, 10%, 0.1%, right? It's only interesting if you can have your audience juxtapose that against something that they understand or else it's just like, oh, great. So, you know, like if I told you I got a 90 on my last exam, well, if the, 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 the class average was 60, that's a lot better than if the class average was 95, right? So it's all, it's all so percentages uh, really come back to that's good. 
Okay. Um, so anybody else? Um, Nassim, yes. Yeah. Um, I definitely see the point about telling a story with data, but I also don't think that it's always about telling a story. Sometimes it's about investigating or finding trends or findings or finding the story, right? So for mm -hmm. example, when I first started here, um, I was tasked with building a, a sort of tracker that would provide like a breakout of all of our entities across the world um, and just like a simple list. But I went ahead and I built this like Power BI report that showed all the, you know, a lot of different data sets depending on what they wanted to see with like a world map view and a heat and a, and a heat map specifically so they can like see by region. And that blew, that just blew them off. Like, like they couldn't believe like that that could be done and it's clickable and it's touchable and Power BI itself is, you know, really cool as well. But there was no, I wasn't trying to tell a story. Sometimes it's just providing that data and, and people are suddenly noticing like, oh, well, this region of the world is our biggest, most important region. And I think that's another cool use of analytics as well. Mm. And for folks, Power BI is a competitor to Tableau. Right, Power BI is Microsoft's tool, I believe, or is Cisco or Microsoft actually? It's it's Microsoft. It's like super easy to learn in comparisons, and I think it's almost cheap, like almost free online. If you guys are interested in learning it, hey, I think there is a free version of it. I think that I think you're right. So yeah, Power BI definitely one to also pay attention to, folks, especially if you want to go into analytics of any sort. Great. Um, let's kind of switch. So um, we'll go back to Sandy for a second. You sort of touched upon business school and kind of getting into business school. And actually, I think that it would be interesting to hear kind of how math as a young, as a middle school or a high school student uh, in India, um, how, how does society there value math education vis-a-vis -vis what you've seen here as I know you're, you, you didn't grow up here, but you're observing what's going on here. You've been living in uh, New York, uh, the New York area for, for a while now. Tell us about that. Tell us about math and sort of how the math investment society puts on you in India and kind of what you experience personally. So in India, the story is very different because there what happens right from the beginning, everyone knows that if they have to get into some good uh, school, good university, good college, they have to uh, pass through uh, some very tough exams, right? So right from childhood, the parents keep grooming their kids with a very strict kind of a view that you have to build a very strong mathematical skills because all the entrance exams are full of uh, quants, article reasoning and uh, reasoning questions, right? Of course, uh, there is there are general knowledge and other things also. But there is a lot of uh, weightage given to uh, quants and analytical skills and reasoning skills. So because of that, like for me at least right from beginning, there is a kind of a general euphoria that you have to be really good in maths all through from the school, early school itself. And uh, if you are good in maths, you start kind of uh, being looked as a, a better off student in the pool, so graduates. That's how kind of... Uh, and it encourages you to uh, encourages you to do even better in there, right? Because now you feel that okay, you are being acknowledged for uh, being good in certain uh, mm. subjects. So that's how it kind of keeps building up. And uh, I, I will say that it's on the negative side. It's bad for people who are somehow not able to pick up well because then you they start getting being compared with the <laughs> guys who are doing well, right? So it's kind of a little kind of I will say. Uh, on the negative Cash side, 22. it's not good. <laughs> yeah, so, so that way it's kind of, uh, it's, it's a kind of a double-edged sword, good for guys who are doing well, but not good for people who are like really not that great. So, so that, that's the story there, yeah. And so on that note, and Lee Fenson, hang on one second, Lee Fenson, I wanna ask one follow-up and then we'll come to you. So let me go to Brian or Nisim, either one of you guys. Um, talk about kind of your, think back, to your life in middle school and high school um, and the, the math teachers you had, the math support you got, whether it be through your, 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 your family, your parents, or you know, the school system more generally, would you say, how would you evaluate it? And do you think there was any point where you feel like it failed you in any way? Either one of you wanna? 
I can jump in on that one. So I wouldn't say that it failed me in any way. I think the hardest thing that uh, you come across as a math student is when am I going to use this? Uh, there's a lot of concepts where you're just blindly doing equations or things of that nature, but you have no idea what the practical application is. Uh, I think the best example I got in high school was when physics started, you know, mending a couple of the equations into the mix. Uh, a lot of it is really, because school is mostly about building the framework of what you could possibly do. School has no idea what you want to do, what you want to do. So I'd say working as hard as you can to have that framework, even if you don't know what it's going to be for, you'd be surprised to tapping into it later. Like in my current positions, I'm diving back to math in like 10th and 11th grade where that question of when am I ever going to use this suddenly gets answered. So mm -hmm. having that as a cornerstone in your mind is definitely helpful just oh, because God. you never know what you're going to do. Oh. Thank you. Nassim, did you want to add to that at all? Like, what was your experience kind of with middle school and high school with respect to math? I wasn't a great math student, but I think that's because math is taught to everybody at the same pace. And I struggled early on. And because the nature of math, it built on itself and the, and the concepts only get more difficult. If you get left in the, you know, behind in the beginning and then you just screwed, you know, moving forward. So I think that's changed with more education on YouTube and Khan Academy and all that, that the world's changing for sure. But that's also a big flaw to at least like the generation growing before that about math. So on that note, how did that, how did that impact your ability to get through some of the college, Brooklyn College math requirements, whether it be, you know, statistics 3100 or operations management 3430 if you took that class or the, I think you probably took like a pre-calc or something like that I'm assuming so honestly it was like pre-calc was maybe one of the hardest like math classes I had taken I loved statistics because I thought I, I saw the relevancy very early on like and statistics makes sense to me so that was easy enough to click but like pre-calc was very difficult and it was a big struggle and I went back to Khan Academy and to YouTube and it's the only way you can kind of like pick up these courses anymore. Mm. Good. Well, at least you took took advantage of the resources out there. So that's good. Uh, Lee Fenton, you had your hand up. Do you want to chime in now? Yes. Um, I totally agree um, with what was said in terms of taking math in high school and college. Even to this day, I'm still learning certain topics that even I've been told by my professor that I'm never going to use again, which is mind boggling. And, um, you know, which leads you to my question, um, you know, personally, I'm not, I'm someone that don't really am interested of doing something like, let's say for algebra, I don't really like to learn um, difficult content if I'm, if I know I'm not really going to use it, if it doesn't pertain to my interests. So what are some ways or what are some things you could do to familiarize your, um, familiarize yourself with, you know, software platforms like IBM, Salesforce, Tableau, um, you know, Oracle and all these, what are some like things you could do or do? Are you supposed to give yourself more homework, take up projects into yourself and programs? How do you try to use these platforms to upskill yourself and really, you know, make you a better candidate when for job applying? I, I, can I take this one? Yeah. So one, I think that like, I, I understand, you know, nobody wants to learn things that they'll never use. But I do think that sometimes a lot of, if you look at, if what's your mindset when you look at these problems? If your mindset is, oh God, like I hate doing this, it's a waste of time, I don't understand it and it's not relevant, then you're not gonna enjoy it. But if your mindset is, this is building my brain muscle, like, because in reality later on, even if you don't use this, that muscle, that skill that you're building, it's gonna come into play somehow. And that's what math at its core is doing for you. So. I challenge you to go back and like, you know, look at it from a different angle uh, and try to go back and see it. But if you want to learn Power BI or Excel, I mean, there's so many resources available on the internet. You don't need to pay anything for it. Like there's obviously stuff on Udemy and tons of websites that'll charge you for it. But YouTube and Google and a book in the, from the library are all free resources that, you know, whatever, whatever you're interested in learning, Alteryx, Python, Excel, it's all somewhere for free on the internet. I would just go ahead and like spend, spend like 30 minutes a day every day on whatever skill you're trying to learn 
and you'll pick it. Even if you only do like 10 or 15 hours of it, you'll be okay for 10 or 15 hours of working on something you've never done before. Sandy, you want to, Sandy or Brian, any yeah. comment on that? I will, I will like to add some things. What I will, I will second uh, Nissim's thoughts in terms of uh, uh, focusing on uh, going through those topics more from the learning perspective. I think building a strong foundation is very important because end of the day, all these various tools which we are talking about are outcome of certain algorithms which have been built by someone, right? It was built on these fundamentals. If you are building a strong foundation for yourself, then tomorrow you can kind of work through any of the tools. If your understanding your concept is correct and your concept is strong, then you can kind of really work through any kind of a tools anywhere, right? So uh, if you are just learning certain tools to use, then you are learning the end use, not how it has been developed, right? So I think in, in the early years, it's very important to have a very strong foundation. It's, you do feel that a lot of things you are doing is not relevant. You may not use it ever. Still, nothing wrong in kind of doing that. As uh, and I'm, I'm sure, like if you learn something once, like I, we may have learned things 20 years ago, but when it comes across uh, in front of us, we recall those concepts and we are able to kind of uh, decipher it, right? So uh, I think it's very important to have a strong foundation. And uh, though it's important to learn the latest kind of uh, tools and techniques. One should never forget to have a very strong foundation as well. Mm. That's my kind of. Uh, so, and by the way, we fence in, I myself in 2020 spent about 300 hours, 300 hours learning Python. Now I have no computer science. I don't have a computer science programming background and, you know, I'm late into my life here, right? I'm not exactly, I'm not 20 like many of you are or thereabouts. And uh, I'm still trying to learn because things are changing so rapidly. And I'll tell you that by learning Python, it's like, I, and I don't know if I'm ever gonna directly monetize that. I, I may never become a Python programmer, okay? But I'll tell you, it helped me um, in two ways I can tell already it's it if you've never done programming which i never really have um learning how to sort of like structure your thinking that you need to do in programming is just it's it's a useful it's a useful uh exercise learning how to structure and frame a problem with um with algorithms or functions that you're building or whatever you're doing right it's learning a new language just builds different neural synapses in your brain. Like you just helping continue to wire your brain uh, more, more elaborately. Also, um, it, and Python may not be the language du jour five years from now. Um, if I do go in a direction that requires some type of programming, now that I have some fundamental Python, I, I took a look, for example, at um, C++ or I looked at something else and I, I start to see the similarities and I see how quickly now I would be able to pick up another software language because I've learned a little bit about one of them. So it works the same way, by the way, with regular you know, linguistics, English, uh, Polish, Russian, whatever, right? It's very similar. I never learned a second language. It was very hard for me to pick up basic Polish now that I have it. I, I look at Slovak or Czech or Russian, and I know words I never would have learned before because I just have more perspective. So with programming or any of these apps we're talking about, Power BI or working with uh, anything like that, when you start learning different ones, it helps you learn the next tool. I'm able to, I can muddle my way through Tableau most likely because I've been working in Excel for so many years. I'll figure it out, right? So it just helps building building that foundation just helps great um all right so question for let's go to brian on this one okay so when you think back you graduated uh most recently from brooklyn college um just thinking back and don't worry you know don't say what say as you feel there's no, don't have to be politically correct here okay just when you think about the course requirements that you had going through your degree, 
when it comes to the math, okay, specifically the numerical literacy, what are your thoughts on the program? Would you have liked to have seen less math, more math, different math? Was it about the same? Like now that you're out of the program, like what, what, how would you evaluate that aspect of it? I feel like it actually gave me a pretty solid framework for what I needed to do moving on. So there were parts like cost benefit analysis. I use that every single day of my work. So that was helpful math that I learned in business courses. There's other math, like uh, there was uh, financial, like uh, I think it was like some type of economics that was like a higher level where econometrics, there were concepts in there. Maybe econometrics I hear is pretty, it's pretty math intensive. Was it that class? Possibly that, but uh, okay. it was a lot of advanced concepts that I haven't used yet, but I think this kind of ties into the bigger conversation we just had where, uh, you know, just because you don't know that you're going to need it, that doesn't mean that having that foundation isn't helpful. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's certainly, I feel like it was very well balanced. And okay. even outside of math, you know, for example, I took a class on the Silk Road that I never thought I was ever going to need for anything. Uh, but it actually came up in a really helpful conversation at work one time. So, you know, college just has this fun way of throwing in weird topics or things that you don't think are useful, but it's actually surprisingly well rounded to help you out. And what math class did you take as your core math requirement? Which one was it? Uh, I cool. did the degree in business administration. So I think the core was mostly focused on I think it was like economics and things like but I that. think you have to take one math class, like pre-calc or, or business math or thinking mathematically. Did you take one of those classes? I feel like it was probably a business math course. Uh, okay. I forget. No, okay. Statistics was another one in there that was uh, not a perfect right. college. And, was... and Nassim, what would you say? What's your opinion of sort of like, would you have liked to have seen more math, less math? It was about right in college. I mean, I, I, I agree. I think it's I think it's about right. It got me to where I needed to be. My focus is more on maybe I should have learned more math when I was younger because I had to make up for it. And but ultimately, no matter no matter like what the college does or what the courses look like, like you do have to take it upon yourself to spend the time to learn new skills and new things that you're just not going to pick up in a classroom. Fair enough. So just a couple more questions from me, and then again, so the audience, I hope you have some questions for our panel. Um, remember, this is the time where you should be thinking about what you'd like to ask and just go ahead and hit the hand raise, the digital hand raise, and then we will uh, we'll call on you. So this is a good time to think about your questions for the panel. So while you guys are thinking, um, I saw a statistic that 25% of college students suffer from moderate to severe math anxiety. A statistic was research was done somewhere, I don't recall where, but not, not too long ago. Did any of the three of you feel that you ever, can you relate to that? Did you ever feel you were in a situation where you felt um, that, that math anxiety, whether it be at work or during your college time? Anybody? Yeah. Um, I still remember this day. I was taking a cost accounting exam. And for the uninitiated, cost accounting is like the most managerial accounting, like calculating whether or not you should produce a product because it's profitable or it's not profitable. It's like the most practical of the accounting. And I remember just sit, sitting down that day, like not prepared for the exam and looking at the formulas. Sorry, looking at the questions and just thinking like, I don't know how to do this and just skipping and just skipping and just skipping and starting to freak out that I don't know how to do any of these equations. And it wasn't that I didn't know how, it's that just because it was worded a little bit differently and I saw numbers and I just panicked and I just couldn't, I couldn't make it through it. Mm. I think I ended up getting like a 65 on that exam. Mm. I hear, I've, 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 listen, I've been there myself. How about Sandy? I know you, you claim that math was, sounds like one of your strong suit from when you were a student. Did you ever deal with any yes. math anxiety? No, actually, whenever I came across math, I felt happy that my life is easier now. <laughs> <laughs> actually, during MBA, like I used to love my papers in operations research and statistics because there's where like cakewalk. You can easily score as much as you can. 
Fair so enough. for me, it was like uh, the reverse in terms of really felt happy when I saw maths and then, oh, life is easier. You have to <laughs> do less of work. <laughs> okay. Your anxiety. But I do kind of recall a uh, lot of my friends who used to have really tough time in kind of right. uh, getting ready for the exams for those papers and all. And I used to help them a lot, but I used to feel come, come across a lot of uh, people who were, they were really good, but in some papers, they were like, when it came to maths, they were really getting jitters. Right. right. And Brian, I'm curious. In the, I don't. Did you need? Did you need the GMAT for the uh, Baruch program? I did need the GMAT for the Baruch program. Uh, so why don't you I tell would... tell 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 the students a little? They may not know about the GMAT exam. Why don't you give them a little bit of four one one on that? Uh, there's not too much more to go into than like if you took like the SATs or anything like that. It's basically uh, something that's trying to push the boundaries of what you already know. So the GMAT kind of takes the foundational stuff that you know and tries to kind of like Nassim said, like put it into different contexts that you might not recognize it in or try to like push what you accept is like math. Like for example, I think a good concept for the test is like knowing how to do rough numbers. Like if they're giving you 23.72 and then they ask you to plug it in somewhere, you need to know how to say, okay, it's close enough to 20. Let me work this in and get me close to an answer. Because a lot of it is trying to do what you learned very quickly, and you just physically don't have enough time to do it. So it's knowing the concepts by heart, so that way you're able to get to close enough as an answer, and then you see close enough as a choice, and then that's where you need to be. Mm. So a lot of it's just the time crunch is more anxious than the actual work itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so no, fair, fair enough. So. Um... How about you and the math anxiety thing? Is that something you've ever had a, ever felt felt or had experienced? I'm probably the Goldilocks in this panel. You know, I never really had math anxiety, but you know, it wasn't like my best friend either. It was just kind of another thing that was there, and I just knew I needed to know how to do it. So, uh, yeah, I was pretty. Hey, math I've had math. I'm I'm good at math, and I've had math anxiety um, personally. You know, I, you know, but my math anxiety came simply out of lack of preparation. Like going to too many parties, not studying until the night before, physics three exam or whatever, calc, sort of differential equation calculus or whatever I was taking at the time, thinking I can just wing it and then showing up at, at my midterm or whatever exam and like, whoa, <laughs> not gonna happen today. So I've, I've, I've had those situations personally, but those were in my wild youth years. Not so much anymore. So, okay, so we have a question. Jessica, this is a good time. Go ahead, unmute yourself and ask away. Hi, how's everyone? So my question is, um, I am a transfer student into Brooklyn College that I, I'm an old, I'm an older um, student, so, how can I improve in my math? Because honestly, the last time that I was, let's say somewhat in school was in 2004. And when I was in, in school in that 2004, before I transferred into um, Brooklyn College. So I started Brooklyn College in uh, 2019, but I really didn't take too much math. Um, how can I improve my math skills? Well, and- uh, Let me ask you quickly, what are you majoring in Jessica? Uh, public accounting. Okay, Nassim, this, this, maybe Nassim can help you with this because he kind of talked about it a few minutes ago, actually. So I don't, you know, first off, public accounting, you're not going to use a whole lot of math. So at least that's settled, but it does simplify the equate, you know, like the focus, what type of math are you trying to get more proficient at? Um, I think there's tons of resources. I'm a big Khan Academy fan. I, so if you've never heard of Khan Academy, Google it. There's so many math courses that you can take. Um, and you can use that as a refresher on whatever areas that you're looking for. Um, I, I, would, I would start with that. And then, you know, there's, I'm sure there's like textbooks that have practice questions if you're really interested. But that alone, I think, will get you 95% of where you want to be easily. Okay, because honestly, I only had to take just uh, two, two math courses, uh, which is statistics, and then the other one is going to be uh, next semester, which is business analytical. That's all. I, that, those are the only two that I have to take. Like, I just want to know, like, 
uh, improving wise, how can I improve more? But I'll look into Khan Academy. Thank you. The other thing I can say, Jessica, is, and the, it's a little bit, and, and by the way, that's partly why we created this Math Minds project in the first place, is to try to give you an extra resource. But of course, there's only so much we're going to be able to do live. Uh, so Khan Academy is a great resource with all sorts of recorded content. So I would, uh, I would uh, echo uh, Nassim's words on that. But I'll just also add that Brooklyn College has the Learning Center, and the Learning Center provides uh, free tutoring uh, for um, different uh, different courses. And um, I know that they have, now, I don't know if you have to be registered in the course to sit with a tutor for the course, but what you might wanna do, if you do not, Jessica, what you might wanna do is find, is, is, is get the schedule of the learning center. And I think they are doing virtual stuff, uh, but don't quote me, I, I, I think they are. Um, uh, contact the learning center, find out what they're doing. Maybe there's, I don't know if there's anything going on over the summer, um, but just sit with one of their tutors for one of the kind of core math classes, not calculus, not pre-calculus. For example, one of the core fundamental, I think that there's a course called Thinking Mathematically, for example, at Brooklyn College out of the math department. And that's a nice sort of basic level primer math course. If there's a tutor, in the learning center for thinking mathematically, I think you would also find that useful. Okay, so check that out. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Liat? Um, guys, yeah, Lily. Um, I, I, I think that Khan Academy is a really good idea. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm wondering though, because I just looked it up, Khan Academy doesn't really have accounting. Anyone know of like a good thing for accounting because because everything is online. It's been really a struggle this semester, and we're, I'm not even sure when it's going to come back on campus. Does anyone know of a really good place where I can study for accounting? I, I have a, a whole guide for business students that I wrote back in the day. Happy to forward that to you. Um, I think I have like a list of like of of like a playlist or a resource for every accounting class, so I can share that with you like later on, or I'll try to find it now. I'll, Great. I'll, I'll link that in the chat. Yeah, if you find Thank that you before so we're done, you can put it here. If not, send it out to Michelle Hess and Michelle will send, the, send it out to the community. Thanks for that offer. And Liat, also for you, um, I think the Learning Center also has support for uh, accounting um, courses. I'm pretty sure it does. So check out the Learning Center. They, they just started like two weeks ago. They just oh. started two weeks ago. We only have one week left. So it's like, I yes. really behind my accounting class. <laughs> so it's like, oh, you mean, brain. you mean for a course you're taking literally right now? Are you referring to? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh. I'm like eight chapters behind. <laughs> it's oh. really bad. I study okay. for my accounting. And now I'm my, I'm a major is like accounting. So it makes things very difficult because everything's online and there wasn't not much tutoring. And there's like, it's really bad. I'm, I'm, an, I'm not a book person. So, you know. You know, then I don't know what your budget entails, but you can go onto a platform like Wizant and find like a paid accounting tutor. That also may be useful for you. If it was a regular time of the year, I'm sure there are, account there are tutors that advertise, you know, put flyers up on campus, but you can't go to campus right now. So um, that's out. But you may want to look into a tutor who can actually, if you can afford, if you can, you know, and online tutors can be more economical. You can find someone online that won't break the bank. So ch check into that as well. But uh, thank the you. Same, you said Wizan W I Z A N. Sorry. You said Wizan W I Z A N T. W Y. Z-A-N-T, W-Y-Z-A-N-T. That's just one example of a tutoring platform with paid tutors, you know, and you can find people at all different price points, you know, and since you're doing it online, you might find someone sitting somewhere else that could, you know, help you at a reasonable price. Okay, thank you. All right, more questions. Anybody, questions for our for our esteemed panel. Any other questions for our esteemed panel? Have you thought about any questions for these guys?
Well, I have one more. While you're still thinking, I have a question. And this is really um, for all of you. And I guess we can go maybe in the order. Um, Sandy, Brian, Nassim. Um, just give some, just in your own words, just give some final advice for soon to be graduating seniors. Final advice for soon to be graduating seniors. I'll start with Sandy, then we'll go to Brian, and then we'll go to Nassim. I think uh, uh, since we are talking about maths here, I will say uh, having a very strong uh, foundation of various uh, aspects of maths is really helpful in your career all through. So, it, and it does open a lot of doors when it comes to uh, certain careers where a uh, lot of what is, is begin, being given to uh, cons and analytical skills. If you are good at that, you can have a easy kind of uh, walk through into those careers. And once you are in, and if you have really sound skills, you can really grow well and grow fast. So I think, uh, I think for the, all those guys who are just stepping into uh, the corporate world with her, uh, some new job, all the best for your uh, kind of uh, uh, career and make use of uh, quant skills and math skills to really make it big. Thank you, Sandy. Brian before, Brian, before we go to you for the same question, there was a question that came through in the chat bar from Jashiba. And he asked, what do you find to be the most challenging in the work environment? I don't want to throw you off with that question for you, but does anybody want to Want to want to jump in before Brian gives his final thoughts here? What do you find um, to be the most challenging in the work environment? So, any of anyone on the panel? Do you go ahead, Brian? I saw you unmute yourself. So, if you want to jump, <laughs> I was unmuted earlier, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> um, I would just say I think that at least for like accounting or ta you know tax, sometimes you learn a lot of these concepts in school and then you're pushed in real life and you see the real life application and you're just super confused. And I think embracing the real side aspects of things is, is challenging along with being a responsible adult human being in the professional world. Um, suddenly you have all these responsibilities, your job could be intense, you know, so, so that, that's, a, that's a growing challenge. If you're right now, you're in college and you're able to skip classes and sleep till 11 a.m., I mean, enjoy it while you can. <laughs> Fair enough. Brian, think, back uh, to you. Yeah, sure. So I'll jump in there and say, uh, I think the most challenging part of a work environment is just uh, knowing how to be resourceful and knowing how to be adaptable. Because uh, there's a lot of times where a situation that isn't exactly your job comes up, but you should still, you know, it looks good on you. And it's good for yourself to be able to find the answer, be able to, you know, uh, be helpful in that way. Uh, so just not being so cold cut in what your job is and being able to open up to different uh, aspects that could be helpful is uh, definitely good to have. Uh, I'll circle back. I saw another question in the chat since I opened it up about uh, where do we use math outside of work? Uh, I think a big... A big one in there, which uh, I forget who my retail friend was in here, but uh, percentages are super helpful in day-to-day -day life. Uh, you know, especially if you're, you know, if you're a big shopper, you know, knowing how to you know, quickly de decipher what a percent off actually means. You can know if you're getting a good deal or not. Uh, so that's kind of a little micro aspect of where math comes in uh, handy outside of the workforce. I can echo that one, by the way. And if you think about it, let me just jump on that for a second. Because if you think about, and I, and I think about this a lot, what Brian just said, actually. Um, what is marketing trying to get you to do? Buy their product, right? Buy their product or service. So to get you to buy their product or service, they're going to feed you information in a way that hopefully will end with you buying their product or service. And what are they gonna do? They're gonna serve up information in a way that sounds compelling, that you may think, and it may be sort of like, you know, when we go out on a date, we put on our best suit and put on makeup and do our hair up, right? We sort of put our best foot forward. Companies will put their best foot forward, try to get you to buy their product or service. And sometimes, show you the information in a way that seems compelling 
but in fact, when you dig into it, if you understand the numbers, is not necessarily as compelling as they make it sound to be. I was actually, we were actually thinking about doing an entire math mission on kind of like fake math or like, let's say misleading math, which is a very real thing. Um, which when you hear about companies like research says that nine out of 10 dentists prefer Colgate. You know, when you hear quotes like that, right? But if you, if you dig into that and that one specifically, when you dig into it and you learn how they ask the question, you realize that nine out of 10 is not as great as it sounds in the commercial, right? So you've got to really, you only know that when you're really, uh, when you're really numerically literate and it works the same with percentages. All right, sorry to take over again with the commentary. Let's go to, uh, so uh, um, Brian, any final words you wanted to just in terms of like advice? Uh, well, first of all, stay in school, kids. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> jokes aside, uh, I think just in whatever you do, uh, stay persistent, uh, especially if anyone's like going into recently graduating. Uh, finding a job can be difficult, and you may have to do a lot of applications. So uh, just staying very persistent in what you do and not getting, uh, you know, uh, trying to discourage, that would be the right word to use there. Uh, even if something seems difficult, just kind of persevering through that, it's really helpful. And then once you get into work, I mean, whether you like it or not, work's probably going to be at least 40 hours of your week. So Nassim kind of touched on, touched on this too. Having a good work-life balance, you know, math isn't always going to be present outside of work. So, and for good reason, you know, it's leisure time. So make sure you're kind of taking care of yourself too, and you know, keeping that balance strong because that'll help you not get burned out. Fair enough. Thank you, Brian. And Sandy, you have the last word. Oh, yes, as I said, uh, like, uh, uh, going into, uh, when you're stepping into the corporate world, maybe on your first job, it's kind of really uh, important to kind of uh, uh, have a good start in terms of uh, defining exactly what you want to do, get it to the right kind of a track, which is really in line with your interests and then build upon it. Like, uh, like job and personal life is not like always two different things. Ultimately you are spending uh, eight hours, 10 hours a day on your job. So it's always a to do what you like doing. So it's just kind of uh, spend time, invest time in finding out the right thing for you and then focus on that. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. All right. That was awesome. So any, so I'll just ask one last time for any questions, any more questions from, from you guys. Uh, Zach, you haven't asked any question. I'm actually very surprised. Benjamin, Yuki, anybody? No questions for these guys. Daniel? No. Okay. Hang on, there's a question. Hi. I have a question. Okay, Yuki, hi. Yes, hi everyone. Um, I'm a junior accounting student at Brook College and I recently received an offer from Microsoft to join them this summer as a data science research fellow. So um, my question is, if I'm making a career transition from a field to a different field, um, how can I make most advantage of my um, internship and um, what I can do to prepare for my future career? Thank you. Anybody from the accounting side want to take that one? So uh, if I understood you correctly, uh, if I, sorry to cut the seam, I want to make sure we understood um, the question correctly. So what, uh, what Yuki, you 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 transitioned from what to data science? What were you doing before, or what did you change your major? I didn't quite catch that. Um, I'm still an accounting major, but I applied for um, the Microsoft internship this summer and got accepted. I haven't ah. changed my major. Okay, so you're. Oh. So go ahead. Anybody want to want to 
want to comment on on Yuki's question? So I, I will say uh, there are a few things. One is uh, uh, this is the, your first job. So ac in terms of academics, you have uh, pers pursued your uh, program in accounting that is good. And uh, if you don't have very strong uh, a kind of uh, affiliation to do a job in accounting itself, then it's okay to kind of explore things which uh, kind of uh, give you a broader perspective once you have spent some time and if you feel that that area is interesting, data science is an upcoming field. And uh, if you really like it, then you can build a career in that. So unless you have a very strong kind of affiliation to just work in accounting, this is a good option to kind of pursue and explore. Because well, I just say just one thing, like, at times what happens, like uh, you may pursue a program in certain field and then uh, after working in some area, you some specific field, you may feel that oh, that this is much more interesting than I that I was more than I studied, right? So it's it's always good to kind of experiment, kind of explore a few things in your early career, and then uh, in a couple of years, once you build a perspective, okay, this is what is really interesting and excites me, further build upon it. I would add that like it's probably the best time for you to to pivot because you're so young, you're, you're just starting, you just have an internship. Like it's it's not the end of the world if you're finding out now, it's much better to figure it out now than in 20 years down the line that you're not interested in what you're doing. Um, and having, you know, multi you know, different experiences sometimes it makes you unique. If you have accounting and data analysis, data science, like you might, that might put you a, a leg above a person who only has data science, uh, you know, background, like suddenly you're more, of a business or focus, or you have these other concepts that you can bring to the table. So it's not any means like a negative connotation at all. I would really take advantage of it. Yeah, and and yeah, and by the way, even if you are 20 years in, if someone asked me the same question uh, in their 40s, um, 20 years in, you know how many people are changing their career, pivoting their career in their 40s these days? More than you may realize. So I, 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 Yuki, I, you know, I wouldn't sweat it too much. You're not really at a point now where anybody's expecting any type of, you know, major track record from you. Um, so just go for it. Um, and then Nassim, Nassim, um, there's a question about the CPA exam preparation in the chat box. Sure. Uh, you want to so, comment on that? Sure. So for you public accounting kids, the, just know that the CPA exam is essentially four different exams that you're required to pass within 18 months of your first exams passing grade. So once you've finished your first exam and you get a passing, you have 18 months to complete the next three. So based on that logic, you, you should really prioritize taking the hardest exams or whatever is the hardest for you. Most people would argue that FAR, financial accounting, is gonna be the most difficult of the exams. I would take that exam first as an undergrad. I was an idiot and I said, somehow I'll have more time when I graduate and I'll be able to do this while I'm working. And it's the biggest lie that you'll have more time somehow after graduation. If you prioritize it now, you'll be so much more thankful. You'll be doing your future self a big favor. I am like, I'm trying to wrap up my last exam now um, so I've been able to do it, but it's been a pain. I've been studying during busy season, studying like while like I'm driving, studying, like choosing not to go out with friends because I have to get this done. So I would, so in terms of arranging your time to prepare and how to balance that, do it as soon as you can. Start with the biggest one. Um, you know, if you already are bu a busy person and you already have work and life and all these other aspects as you're studying, you have to just be disciplined, make a schedule stick to it, commit to putting the time in, you know, you're not, it's not going to just have, fall into your lap. It's, it's, you can't wing it. You really have to put in the time. Um, and then if I can also answer one of the top questions on like using math on my, like outside of work, I do like a lot. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time doing like keeping track of like investments and understanding like, fi you, know, per, you know, personal finance and a lot of these aspects. And, and I try to get an understanding of, you know, your returns year over year and your, 
expenses, like like for example, if you're paying, if you if you invest in like mutual funds, you pay a management fee, right? You have an understanding of what these fees will ultimately add up. Your, you, I, I do a lot of like math just on my finances. So that's something that's totally unrelated, but I take a re, there's a real, I have a real equity and real stake in learning this because it, finance, giving that financial literacy is super important, you know, not just to myself, but to like my friends and family. And everybody knows we had a personal finance math mission, right? One of our math missions was exactly on that topic. So now you hear it echoed. So we have another question in the chat box. Maybe Sandy, since you're, you know, more years into your career, uh, maybe we can get your perspective on this question, which I guess was asked after I made my comment about changing career path. But, you know, um, what is your thought on this? The question is, why do people change their careers so much in their 40s? Is there such a thing as a money market in a career versus not so much money making in a career? Which jobs are more money based for life? I'm not sure what that last part means exactly, but you get the gist of the question. So I will share my experience. Like I have changed almost eight jobs in the last 18 years. <laughs> and uh, I, I will say in first 10 years, I did kind of a lot of uh, hopping around, uh, not just jobs, but uh, industries. Like I have changed industries, right? So again, it was more to kind of experience, uh, experience uh, things which I have not done so that I can figure out if something is much better than what I'm kind of doing. But uh, eventually after maybe eight, 10 years, one has to settle down and figure out and try to kind of build up on, uh, on one of the uh, whatever sector you pick up and uh, become expert in that, right? Because if you have to grow and reach to a top management, you cannot be a newbie there with two years of experience. You have to have significant in-depth knowledge of that sector industry and hands-on experience of handling multiple roles, right? Which comes with years of experience. So I will say it in early years, it's good to kind of hop around and explore uh, certain industries, new industries and try on different things. But at some point of time, we need to kind of uh, really think through and uh, figure out what is it that you want to do and build up on your career on that. There are kind of people who kind of hop around industries uh, at uh, after spending 20 years or so. That is again uh, to do with uh, uh, trying to do new things in life, right? So once you do certain thing for 10, 15 years, you get bored. You might try to do something different. And uh, it's, it's end of the day, it's like uh, like when you go out and start working in, out of college, there's a lot of excitement about the new job you do. But few years down the line, you start getting, at times, you start getting bored of the job. There's nothing exciting, not much fun you're getting in it. Then you try something new. It may not click. Then you try something new, right? That's, that's what happens. A lot of people I see in my circle, in my friend circle, who have been in the same job for almost 15 years. And then they say, I need a change. Because not because I need more money or something, but because I'm bored, bored of doing the same thing day in, day out. I want to try something new, right? So there can be different perspectives. A uh, lot of people kind of uh, do kind of uh, switch career because of the field that they are stuck in a job which is not so high paying. And they need to kind of uh, really grow up and uh, uh, make more money in a new job. Maybe it will give them higher uh, salaries. So different dynamics play in different kind of uh, decisions which people take. So, yeah, it's, it's always kind of uh, each person's interest what is driving their job change. And I'll just add one thing to that. And, and Sandy covered it very well. But one thing that in addition is that, you know, we, we talk a lot about upward mobility. You've heard the term upward mobility or looking for higher paying jobs. There are actually people out there, a large segment of people who are realizing at some point in their midway, maybe through their career, that it's no longer so much about the high paying job anymore for them, for whatever their personal reason is. And they have, maybe they feel there's a higher calling towards making a social impact, or they wanna have more flexibility in order to be there for their family or whatever their reasons are, or they wanna work for socially conscious companies. You know, so there are people, it's, it's nice to have that problem, obviously those particular people. And I, I personally heard for the first time, the term downward mobility, right? And there are actually people out there who are purposely 
you know, going in the opposite direction that you would think, going towards a lower paying job for their own personal reason, whatever that may be. So it's not always about upward mobility. Later on, it might be a desire to go down in terms of mobility. So just wanted to throw that out there. All right. Yeah. Go ahead, Sam. And one, one more point I would like to add here is that a lot of times what happens is once you have spent a good number of years in a really challenging and demanding job, you want to kind of move to a job where you get a more balanced life. You can spend more time with your family, with your friends while doing a job. Well, that also drives uh, job change at times. So as uh, Ken said, it's not just kind of a drive to kind of get a higher salary, but a drive for different kind of interests in life, which is maybe more time, maybe trying to do something for society. So there are a lot of things which drive you to do that. You may have heard there was an article somewhere. <laughs> oh, oops, sorry, we've got a little action behind me here. <laughs> Apologies. Life on Zoom, working from home. Um, you may have caught the article where a bunch of Goldman Sachs investment banking analysts um, got together and wrote an open letter to upper management of Goldman Sachs complaining about the work conditions and asking for a cap on an 80 hour work week so that they would not be asked to work beyond, beyond 80 hours, right? Because the expectation that investment banking analysts are gonna work, you know, long hours is kind of, we know that. But I guess some of them were, think, were saying that they were working like 90, 100 hours a week. And um, I've never heard, that's the first time I heard of Goldman Sachs analysts coming out, writing this open letter to management. So there is definitely a push towards a little bit better work-life balance more generally, especially with the starting with the millennial uh, generation specifically and beyond. So you're definitely seeing more of that than you did like when I was younger as part of the, the Gen X generation. All right, so it's 7.40 on the note of work-life balance. I promise to keep this to about 7.30 for the panel. So um, uh, I wanna stop here and let's give a, uh, a little virtual applause to our panel. Nassim, Sandy, Brian, thank you guys so much for participating, for helping by giving back to in two of your cases, Brooklyn College, mostly Brooklyn College students, all CUNY students. And Sandy, thank you as well for being here. Um, and I'm gonna applause for you, my camera. Thank you so much. So, and on that note, it also happens to be the end of our live Tuesday meetings until the future, perhaps in the fall, we'll do this again, we'll see. But this is our last meeting for the semester. And um, on behalf of the team here, uh, Zach Ling King, who uh, was so helpful with, uh, with uh, the math missions in the past, and Zach, who was helpful with uh, reaching out uh, behind the scenes uh, to, uh, with marketing communications, and especially to Michelle Hess, who did so much in helping bring this whole thing together. Uh, I applaud you guys and thank you very much for your hard work and participation. Because one thing that you'll see in life and you'll see, and the, and the panel can, can, can attest to this, uh, when you get into the workplace, the most important thing more than anything else, intelligence, all that stuff, is consistency and reliability. If you are consistent and you are reliable, you will be valuable and you will make strides from there. Two very important things. And the Math Minds team has been very, particularly Michelle, has been very consistent and very reliable all academic year for that matter. So thank you guys. And for everybody else on the call, Daniel, everybody on here, pretty much everybody, except for one or two of you, you've been here week in and week out for the last month or two. And I'll, we'll be compiling attendance this week, I'll be checking that out. I'll be going to the Zoom attendance list and we'll see what the final stats look like. But I see names on here. You guys are coming every week and coming back. So really we do appreciate you. And I will tell you that one, uh, one, even though this is our last meeting, um, you will, we will be asking you some questions about the Math Minds Project in the form of a little quick research 
uh, poll. So please help us out by giving us your thoughts uh, after the fact on this whole thing that we've done here, right? All of us have been doing this. It's an This Math Minds project is essentially an experiment to provide additional enrichment in terms of numerical literacy as an extracurricular activity. And we do want to hear from you. And I'll probably be coming to a few of you for a little bit of a video interview, like a five, 10 minute video interview to get your thoughts. Okay, so look out for emails from us on both the uh, survey as well as a possible interview. So thank you folks for, be for being part of this and this journey. And uh, I guess on that note, I wish you all the best of luck as you approach finals and the end of your semester. And anybody graduating, by the way, raise your hand if you're graduating in, uh, in May. Raise your digital hand on the raise. Anybody graduating? Anybody? Jashib is graduating. Well, congrats in advance, Jashiba. Anybody else graduating? Well, maybe you can unmute yourself or uh, don't know, don't, not in position to raise your digital hand. I'm sure some of you are graduating. For the rest of you, we'll see you uh, hopefully next fall with more Math Minds Project activity. And um, yes, the video will be uh, uploaded to YouTube. You'll get to watch it again. We'll upload that tonight. Any final questions or thoughts from, from the, uh, the audience? All right, well, I am going to stop the recording here.